Hi, and welcome to the Environment TV Forum. I'm Charlie Olson, your host. For today, we'll be talking about geoengineering, preserving wildlife, and nuclear energy. We also have a few short news items and fun with nature pieces for your viewing pleasure. Our forum members for this episode include Ken Gale, an author, a host, founder and producer of Ecologic, a decades-long running weekly radio show broadcast on WBAI at 99.5 FM, which is concerned with the entire comprehensive field of the environment. Ken is also a traveling environmental guest presenter at various civic organizations gatherings and a longtime hardcore birder. Lenny Labrizi, he's the host of the podcast, and now a word from our environment, and is a retired NYC gardening specialist from the, from the show Grow NYC program, and worked with community gardeners for 31 years. He managed the community gardens mapping project, a catalog of open spaces in NYC, and he teaches horticulture and environmental workshops. Mark Latour, an author and former land management expert who worked at the city and state level and is presently on the New York State Open Space Conservation Plan, which is helping to choose where environmental monies, that's in the billions of dollars, will be spent throughout New York State. His recent legislative initiatives include the Drought Reduction Bill, as well as the Reforestation Jobs Bill. And joining us today after her holiday last week is Marilyn Ellie, a longtime anti-nuclear advocate at the Indian Point Nuclear Reactor in New York State, and was one of four people highlighted in the documentary Indian Point, the movie. We're glad to have you with us, Marilyn. Welcome. Thank you. All right, now let's turn to another topic, a very large topic, nuclear energy and all that that entails. For that, we have Lenny Labrizi, who, by the way, was personally involved in the closure of the Shoreham nuclear facility on Long Island, New York. And for that matter, both Ken Gale and Marilyn Ellie were around and involved back then. Lenny? Thanks, Charlie. And yes. it's an honor to be doing this with two longtime anti-nuclear advocates. Um, uh, let me just give a kind of short intro into some of the things that we want to be talking about, because there's been a lot of interest lately in nuclear energy in the mistaken belief that it is carbon free. There's also been a lot of press about nuclear fusion, as scientists have been able to create more energy than they used in experiments done in the lab. But fusion is a long way from being viable, but the nuclear industry is using these breakthroughs to promote any kind of nuclear energy. The most, the most recent nuclear flavor of the month are what are called small scale reactors, which the industry hopes will make siting and building reactors more palatable to investors, regulators, and nearby residents. Um, right now, the government is also relaxing rules and oversight, even though the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has always pretty much been a rubber stamp for the industry. This is well documented in Gregory Jaxo's book, Confessions of a Rogue Nuclear Regulator. The government and industry have still not figured out what to do with nuclear waste, and the temporary storage sites are disasters waiting to happen. The average age of nuclear power plants in the United States is 42 plus years, pushing the limits on their life expectancy. One new nuclear reactor came online in 2016, and one in 2023, and one is expected to begin operating in 2024. At the moment, no others are currently under construction in the United States. In some cases, nuclear power plants are built in order for countries to develop the technology to build nuclear weapons. The world's nuclear stockpiles have somewhat leveled off, 
but are still holding firm at about 12,500 weapons. Vladimir Putin is threatening to use nuclear weapons in space. And locally on Staten Island, where I live, a site where uranium to be used in the Manhattan Project, the uranium was stored at this site from 1939 to 1946. The uranium came from the Belgian Congo, which has changed its name at least three times. Anyway, the federal government has begun, just begun a cleanup of the site 80 years later. Continuing on with nuclear waste, the release of radioactive tritium has been in the news as well lately with releases at Fukushima and also uh, with the decommissioning at Indian Point. There are many videos on the nuclear issues on the Environment TV if you want to do some deep diving into the into and do some research on your own, including a conversation I had with Joel Kupferman and the links will be uh, below in, at the end of this uh, video. And a, real, a rarely discussed issue is the health effects for those who live in proximity to nuclear reactors. Several articles written by Joseph Mangano, the executive director for the Radiation and Public Health Project in New York, highlight some of those issues. And I think that's where I'd like to start since um, we have with us Marilyn Ellie, who lives very close to uh, the Indian Point reactor, and Ken Gale, who also wrote a book a number of years ago called Chernobyl on the Hudson, again, speaking about um, the Indian Point reactor. So I'd like to ask you guys uh, if you have any comments about the health effects of living close to a nuclear reactor. Well, several years ago, I met people who referred to themselves as downwinders, downwinders from uh, the nuclear testing that was going on quite a while ago. But some of these people were babies. Some of them were actually in utero. And some of them were um, young children who were out playing when radiation was released uh, as part of our testing. Um they suffered their whole life. One of the the women that came here to Westchester to talk to us about um, said she was in college before she sort of put two and two together and went to a doctor. And the first thing the doctor said was, when were you exposed to radiation? So the health effects from being exposed to radiation are are severe. And there, the National Academy of Science says there is no safe level of exposure. And of course, it's cumulative. So these people that were stuck in the downwinder pathway um, didn't, first of all, didn't know about it. And second of all, when they did know about it, there was really nothing they could do. And people in the government would not listen to them. They didn't want to hear about it. So I think it's time for these health effects to be carefully looked at. And um, I think you're, you're going to be talking about RECA, the bill that just got passed, Lenny. Did you want to say something about that? It just happened today, so I didn't include it in my introduction. But yes, the, that bill has been um, extended by Congress. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the effects of that will be, but hopefully that means that people will will be reimbursed for any health issues that they get from being exposed. Yes. I think they're looking at the period, I have it here, from January 21st, 1951 to October 31st, 1958. People who thought they were exposed during that period um, or were physically present at any place within certain spe specified locations. Mm -hmm. And all along, uh, people who have been um, reimbursed, uh, I, I believe it's under the disabilities. Um, uh, uh, Disabilities Act for uh, being exposed to nuclear things. That's been going on for a long time, but you don't hear very much about it. It's a difficult, it's it's just very difficult. And when it's denied by people in, in power, it's even more difficult. I'm really glad they call it RECA. Um, was it bipartisan? Something to add about yeah. that? Um, uh, I had been 
uh, an activist with the Shad Alliance, uh, Sound and Hudson Against Atomic Development, uh, for several years when Chernobyl happened. And before Chernobyl happened, there was no interest in anybody publishing even a flyer about nuclear power. Uh, the Nuclear Information Research Service was like the only group that really uh, kept the research going. But when Chernobyl happened, people wanted to know what was happening. Uh, so that's when I wrote Chernobyl on the Hudson. And my emphasis was on the routine emissions, uh, partly because nobody seemed to ever talk about them. The, the emphasis was always on a nuclear power plant accident rather than what happens every day that they operate. They're putting forth radioactivity into the air and into the water every single day. They're called routine emissions, which makes them sound benign. Oh, well, they're routine, who cares? And it's that very routineness that makes them so hazardous to people's health. There's strontium-90 coming out, which, which messes up people's bones and teeth uh, and, and mother's milk. Uh, there's cesium-137 coming out, which messes up your reproductive organs and your muscles. There's iodine-131 hitting your thyroid gland. And then there's tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen. That's coming out every day into the air and water. And that is affecting every single part of your body because tritium is radioactive hydrogen, which means it's in the water. It's part of the water. Uh, so the health effects are enormous. It's It's no surprise that out of the dozens, maybe a hundred studies of cancer clusters around nuclear power plants, they've all been shown that there is a cancer cluster around nuclear power plants caused by these routine emissions. Yeah, when I was doing some research for this piece, I, I, I kept coming across these studies that say, oh, there is no connection between nuclear power plants and and any bad health effects. And I and I kept looking at it and saying, how can that be? The, the, you know, it's... It, it's Definitely yeah, I mean, even in the United States has studies, but it, it's just a, a, amazing. Uh, after Fukushima happened, uh, doctors were told by the government of Japan, if you mention that anyone's health problems, other than suicide, were caused by radiation from Fukushima, you will get your license taken away. So the only doctors in Japan who talked about radiation from Fukushima and what it was doing to people were retired doctors. It didn't matter if their license got taken away. There's, there's this connection between government and the nuclear industry that is, is scary. And we're talking, I mean, one of the main problems is, is cancer. And one of the main problems with talking about cancer is it's got a, a it takes years for it to show up. It's the hard latency, to prove causality. Yeah, the latency period of cancer is years. And Dr. Helen Caldicott, explain latency really nicely if somebody has a cold and they sneeze on you you don't get the cold instantly you get it the next morning or the morning after that right you wake up and now you got a cold and you got it from that person who sneezed on you that's latency for the cold we understand that because it's only a couple of days cancer's latency is years so it's hard to make connections with a specific event on a specific day and the nuclear industry and the government uses that to their advantage. And we're talking about cancer, which of course affects older people and um, and several of us on this broadcast are. For young people, the radioactive waste from a nuclear power plant has to be kept cool and it has to be put in containers forever. The amount of energy that it takes to keep those canisters or the waste pools or wherever the nuclear waste ends up, it takes a tremendous amount of energy for, for the thousands of years that you have to keep that waste cool, right? Do you really want to live in a world where so much of the energy being produced has to go for the nuclear waste produced before you were born? So this is affecting young people in, in a way that, again, I don't think too many people want to talk about. Yeah, the storage of nuclear waste is an issue that, again, I didn't, and there was so many things to, yeah, to right. touch on here, but, you know, the, the government still has not figured out what to do with the nuclear waste. So it's being stored on site, which, again, is going to probably 
multiply these effects that you were just talking about with with you know radiation escaping from the nuclear power plant sites um so from beginning to end you know the, the it's just a, a bad problem and and um you know the the plants that now are in existence at least in this country are all old except for these three that i mentioned earlier and you know that's when problems start happening <laughs> like with us as we are getting old we you know we health effects are starting to show up the same thing is going to happen with these with these uh reactors either that are still operating or that are, are retired again i you know i keep coming back to this that it's the, the, there's problems with with uh, nuclear power from the beginning from the mining to the end um and there is no end at least not in our lifetimes because all of these nuclear materials have very long half lives long of and we're power about half lives <laughs> we're about coming to the end of our section here our segment and you can see we're only talking mainly about one area health and the problems there and we're touching on the others there are many many problems with nuclear energy it is an ongoing topic. We will not be leaving this. Uh, Lenny, you outlined a beautiful array of the problems with nuclear energy, and we just can't get to all of them today. So I hope you're going to stick with us and maybe take another one of those and uh, uh, see the responses of each of the different people here and go more in depth on that. You know, just to sum up, obviously, you know, this is a much bigger topic than we can discuss in in uh, 12 to 15 minutes. And we will have other uh, uh, episodes that we focus more closely on one or more of the things. I guess the bottom line is we should not be building more nuclear power plants because any diversion in that direction is keeping us away from from the cleaner, um, safer sources of energy out there. Amen. <laughs> Every day is Earth Day. I'm Ken Gale. I'm Sally Gellert. And I'm Donna Stein. Every week we bring you environmental experts and activists plus news, in-depth information and solutions to environmental problems. Join us at our new time, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. right here on WBAI New York, 99.5 FM and WBAI.org. Wednesday mornings, 10 a.m. When your air or water are clean, thank an environmentalist. If not, become one. Enough said. Put up a parking lot. <laughs> Charlie, several environmental news items caught my attention this week. After many years, the first offshore wind electricity is being supplied to New York State from a wind farm off the coast of Long Island. Thank God, finally. Another story that was reported by a number of news sources, including the New York Times, is about a tiny forest which is coming to Manhattan, actually to Roosevelt Island, which is part of the borough of Manhattan. A group called I Dig to Learn will plant a 2,700 square foot space with 1,000 perennial trees, perennials, trees, and shrubs. And the next item is Al Gore's Climate Reality Leadership Conference is coming to New York City for the first time on April 12th to the 14th at the Javits Center. For those who want to learn about how they can play a role in addressing climate change, follow the link provided to participate. Our own Charlie Olson participated in Chicago several years ago. And finally, as a follow-up to our discussion on combined sewer overflows, the founder of the Billion Oyster Project in New York City wrote an excellent op-ed on how to clean up the waters around New York City. Hint, fix the waste treatment system to stop the combined sewer overflows. So that's what I have for today, John.
there are three primary anthropogenic, that's human-made processes that lead to species endangerment and extinction. One of them is over-harvesting. Another is the introduction of non-native species, which includes the spread of disease. And the most serious threat that we humans pose to animals and plants is habitat destruction. For most endangered species in the United States today, the most serious threat is habit, habitat destruction. Now, why is this so important to save endangered species? Well, we're losing biodiversity quicker than we ever have in the past. Preserving endangered species safeguards the intricate balance of our planet's life ensuring a healthier and more secure future for ecosystems and people. Mark Latour is going to speak about the Endangered Species Act, which was passed in 1973 and established protections for fish, wildlife, and plants that are listed as threatened or endangered. He will update us on what's been happening and what needs to happen. Mark? When a lot of people, uh... Not everybody even thinks about the topic of endangered species or threatened species or declining species. And when many people do think about it, they think it's something far away, maybe in the Amazon, maybe way up in the Canadian Arctic, maybe in uh, the jungles of Africa. But uh, the process is ongoing you know, throughout the world and including here in uh, New York State. So I just mentioned, for example, that uh, there are quite a few species that are endangered and threatened in New York State. So not only does the federal government have the ability to declare a species as endangered or threatened, but states can do that also. And those uh, lists are not exactly the same. Uh, likewise, there are other organizations around the world that have their own classification systems, and they aren't totally in agreement. Uh, but uh, for example, in New York State, you've got one frog species that's endangered, the eastern tiger salamander that's endangered, uh, five different types of turtles that are endangered. So oh. endangered is the most serious classification. So notice that those are all wetland species. So as the uh, lakes are shrinking and the wetlands are being uh, drained or covered over, um, we don't necessarily notice it, but uh, um, those species are have gone into crisis and steep decline. It's the same way, frankly, with most turtle species uh, all over the world, including in the oceans. There's a 10 bird species in New York State that are endangered. Again, the most serious uh, classification. So it includes the golden eagle, the peregrine falcon. We have a few of those in New York City. Piping plover, which seems to be endangered on much of the uh, East Coast. Uh, the short-eared owl. Uh, four different whale species are endangered. In fact, the uh, North American right whale is down to probably a little bit under 300 right whales in the entire North Atlantic Ocean. There's only one North Atlantic right whale. I mean, the first one that was born uh, this season was hit by a ship and died shortly afterward. And so there's only two or three or just a few born each year. So we have to be very careful for them. Uh, likewise, in the uh, rivers and in the wetlands, again, you've got a lot of mollusks, such as mussels, and mo many of those species are declining all throughout the United States, including New York State. Um, a number of insects, such as the royal fritillary butterfly uh, and the Kerner blue butterfly. Um, I know there's some attempts to um, bring back the royal fritillary butterfly, reintroduce it uh, to certain parts of New York State, including Staten Island. Um, so of the turtles that I mentioned, one is the box turtle, another is the mud turtle, plus three ocean turtles, such as the leatherback, which used to be seen more frequently on places like Long Island. In terms of threatened species, yet there's additional turtles. So Blanding's turtle, which there's a lot of them up toward the uh, uh, Finger Lakes and Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, um, or there's some of them, but they are threatened nevertheless. Uh, Ocean-going turtles like the green sea turtle, the loggerhead turtle, 11 bird species, including the bald eagle and the sandpiper, uh, a mammal, the uh, lynx or the Canada lynx, which is, there are probably still a few up in the Adirondacks. Um, a species of special concern in New York State, yet more turtles and salamanders, 
the southern leopard frog, which is of uh, uh, significance to building projects here in the New York City area. Uh, loons, ospreys, several hawk species, the whippoorwill, uh, the red-headed woodpecker, cottontail rabbit, and a number of uh, high priority species, including uh, uh, mollusks. If you look at the clams, like quahogs, for example, most people don't realize they can live for a couple hundred years. So, you know, people are fishermen or clamors are going further and further out to sea uh, to get uh, these clams. And the clams closer to shore are younger and smaller uh, than they used to be. Um, number of fish species, including the seahorse, uh, which is used in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, are high priority species now. Numerous sharks, stingrays, uh, barn owls, warblers, cattle egrets, which are common in, uh, or used to be common in New York Bay, and there's still some, um, meadowlark and uh, bobwhite. And there are some bobwhite reintroduction uh, campaigns taking place uh, uh, in New York City. The kind of aside is that you <clears throat> mentioned the peregrine falcons, and they happen to survive better in, in, urban environments than they do in the the their natural habitat um with their natural habitat are like cliff sides where they can nest and then and then look for birds and rodents to feed on well in urban environments like new york we have these gigantic bridges which provide wonderful places for them to put their their nests and then, of course, we know we have plenty of pigeons and plenty of rats for them to eat. So I, I, it's kind of a weird, you know, juxtaposition of now, oh, well, maybe the cities are going to help certain species to survive. Not, that's maybe not the way we want to go with this, but you, you know what I'm saying, Mark? Yeah, a lot of them have interesting uh, niches in the uh, environment. Uh, for example, the golden eagle. I used to live in the mountains of Colorado, right along the edge of the Rio Grande River. And they had drilled for uranium in the cliffside. And after they stopped drilling, there were a number of hole, drilling holes and who moves in, but the golden eagle. So, uh, yeah, so, so some like one environment, others like a different environment or need it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the peregrine falcon because the Eastern peregrine falcon subspecies went extinct because of DDT. And it was when DDT was banned after Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, uh, that uh, American falcons from another part of North America could be reintroduced, uh, first to Baltimore, eventually to New York City. And now they're thriving. Uh, there's at least 18 pairs of peregrine falcons nesting uh, on in New York City, mostly on bridges. Um, and uh, it's... It's a it's a interesting success story. Uh, too late for the eastern subspecies, but they're they're doing quite nicely. And if you've ever seen a peregrine falcon make their dive down there to to get prey, it it is just uh, astounding to watch. Um, the other comment I wanted to make, um, I do a lot of work with native plants, and there's a lot of controversy about well, what's native. Uh, particularly to a place like Staten Island, which is an island and and sort of midway between the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. So we have species from both of those places and and then others that uh, neither of those places have. Um, <clears throat> but with climate change, um, the planting zone maps have changed drastically. So now plants that would survive further south than us are now able to survive here, but they're not oh, yeah. officially native to Staten Island. But if we're planning for a warmer climate in the future, some of our plants will not survive and others will. Um, so this is sort of a, a, an effect of the you know warming planet um, that really affects species and maybe we can't like separate it out by state so easily I mean, because if you look at a map staten island looks like it should be part of new jersey but it's part of new york 
Um, you shouldn't have lost that boat race. <laughs> <laughs> New Jersey shouldn't have, yes. Um, and, you know, obviously Long Island has a very different climate from Buffalo or, you know, Plattsburgh, you know, so, or Cape May in New Jersey. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's a lot about habitat and, and species. And also along those lines, um, certain plants um, need a certain insects to for them to survive. We talked about this in a previous episode, where if they're not both around at the same time, and sometimes it's climate change that'll mess with this, one or both of those things is going to um, go extinct. Uh, usually both, because if they if they, if a particular bee or insect pollinates a particular plant, and the because of climate change, the insect comes out and then the flower hasn't opened yet, and then the insect only lives a couple of days and it dies before the flower opens. The, 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 the neither one of those species is going to survive. Yeah, that's a very important uh, effect. So we see a lot of species uh, in this area moving northward where it's cooler as plants and animals and moving up mount, up higher up the mountain where it's also cooler. Uh, so, so that's gonna be a long-term effect that we're gonna feel over the next century. Uh, Mark. Hey, Mark the, I, go ahead. Go ahead I'd like to ask about the uh, cottontail. I heard you mention the cottontail. I, I, how on earth did that get on the threatened uh, list? Because I look at what's eating in my garden and what's eating my flowers, and I see a lot of cottontails. Right. Yeah, I don't know if that's a different subspecies of, of rabbit uh, or what, but uh, I see the cottontail rabbit is endangered in a, a lot of places or of special concern. Oh, okay. They used to thrive in Rockaway, in the Rockaway Peninsula of Queens, uh, and they've been building so much there that the cottontail might be gone now. Um, and it was it was a subspecies that that was adapted to life along the ocean. Uh, and, Mark, the uh, the bill was passed in nineteen seventy three. What additions do we need now? What are some of its flaws? Oh yeah, there's a lot of flaws, uh, Charlie. Um, one is that. Um, First of all, it's a political thing. I mean, um, in other words, these regulatory agencies, people need to agree from the agencies that this is uh, a sufficient enough concern uh, to, to move from one category to the next. So from special concern up to threatened or from threatened up to endangered. And the criteria are really um, inadequate. So for example, if you look at ocean species uh, down along the coast of Florida and Georgia, uh, NOIA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration has a lot of sway there in terms of classifying what's endangered and what isn't. And they will allow a species to go all the way down to 97% reduction before they call it uh, endangered or Ooh. before they uh, don't allow people to uh, uh, fish for that species. And it's quite similar with uh, you know mammals and other land, wildlife, and birds. Uh, the criterion is just wacky. So, for example, we have only about 300 wolverines left in the lower 48 state, and yet uh, there's a struggle to get them listed as endangered, um, which seems outrageous. Uh, and because when you're down to 300 of a species, how many breeding pair do you have? Maybe uh, 70, uh, 75. And so that leads for a very uh, few offspring uh, who can make it, and there's so many challenges if they are born. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's a difficult political thing. Plus, it takes many many years, um, and the groups there's there's interest groups out there, whether they're hunters or fishermen or or loggers or ranchers, who do not want these species um, uh, on any kind of protected list. So we've seen that with one of the uh, grouse species out in the northern plains and the in the western states. So it's, unfortunately, it's a very political um, decision rather than a scientific decision uh, to get onto these lists and to move up the lists. It's also an economic decision. Uh, growth and development of our business and our culture, where we want to expand and the animals and the plants are in the way. 
and we haven't talked about the Chinese uh, and other groups that like to uh, eat exotic foods <laughs> or heading in the other direction, becoming a vegetarian. How would that really help? I mean, there's, there are a lot of groups that work on endangered species issues. And one of the things that they, they have to say, do not list certain species in Asia, because as soon as they get listed as endangered, there are a bunch of American collectors who will want them now. Wow. And that will be the death knell of that species. It will be extinct in the wild. And then once the ones that they capture die, then they'll be extinct totally. Uh, and so they can't list certain species, even if they are really, really endangered. And, and the other thing I want to talk to when it comes to this is morality. We do not have the moral right to destroy an entire species forever. You want to sum up anything there, Mark? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of other species in the same uh, category, like the uh, seahorses are being uh, plundered. Uh, that's actually related to the... Uh, a traditional Chinese medicine and the um, long-tailed macaques of a Southeast Asia. Uh, they're pulled out of the trees and uh, sold for $50,000 a piece. So that's quite a quite a uh, incentive for people who are uh, poor. Uh, and certainly there's a morality questions there very much uh, going against uh, uh, economics and survival. I would agree with that. I <laughs> And that may be a good note to... Uh to leave on for this particular topic. There are a lot more questions, a lot more uh, to talk about as all of our questions, uh, all of our topics are. So Hi, I'm Marilyn Ellie. Uh, I'm really glad to be working with Charlie Olson and some other really wonderful environmentalists on the Environmental TV Forum. And here's just a really brief, short notice about planting those seeds you don't have to wait do it now do it now and it's called winter sowing but actually you can start winter sowing in february you have to be careful with what you plant of course lettuce like black seeded simpson is a really good one uh, i planted some in my garden before the last uh, snowfall and i'm going out to see <laughs> i'm looking every day now to see if it's starting to come up but it's very hardy in the cold does not matter wintering over you can just leave it outside a lot of people use a milk jug as a container and uh, fill it about cut it in half fill it about halfway up sprinkle seeds in it tape it back together velcro it back together however you want to do it and just let it sit take the lid off so it can get some snow and rain in it and wait until your seeds come up and you can do that right now it's not too late and i know uh, <laughs> as all those seed catalogs come in i really 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 want to to get my hands in the dirt and in my garden and so this is a way to jump start everything and it gives you some absolutely delicious salad greens for your table so try some winter sowing get some lettuce seeds or uh, any any kind of the brassica, uh, you could plant um, Brussels sprouts, for example, but they take longer to grow. Lettuce is the most uh, satisfying because it comes up right away and you can eat it. So you're looking for lettuce seeds and uh, a milk jug and a little bit of uh, dirt, either from your garden or from um, from the store. Either way will work for this because it's all outside. And uh, looking forward to some nice green leaves on your table. <laughs> Thanks a lot for watching environmental tv bye-bye now we turn to geoengineering with ken gale there are a lot of forms of this and they are supposedly being offered to stop the environmental problems of greenhouse gases overheating the planet and other devastations that are coming at us in this climate chaos climate crisis or whatever you want to call this time that we are living in now ken let us know your take on this. Um, you'd think that any solution to climate change would, would be welcomed by, by every environmentalist on the planet. But the but governments and corporations have managed to create what they call solutions that will make things so much worse. It's amazing. Um, in Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, which is kind of a climate change 101, uh, but there's a chapter on geoengineering, and she went to a scientific conference in Scotland where they're seriously proposing, and 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 they had the ear of governments now, that they want to 
spray sulfuric, sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere. And what this is supposed to do, they're calling it solar radiation management, because geoengineering is a word taken up by a lot of conspiracy theorists. And this sulfur dioxide is supposed to reflect the sun's radiation away from Earth. Sulfur dioxide, when, when combined with water vapor, and there's a lot of that in the atmosphere, becomes sulfuric acid. And so you're, they're seriously proposing putting sulfuric acid into the air. Now, sulfuric acid is heavier than air, so it's going to come down. We're going to get an acid rain that's worse than the acid rain that we were getting in the 70s and 80s. Because this is sulfuric acid, not carbonic acid. And this, uh, to begin with, when it knocks solar radiation away, what is it going to do to our crop yields? What is it going to do to solar energy? What's it going to do to um, almost anything that needs the ocean? But when it comes down as acid, now you've got more acidification in the ocean, which is acidified as it is. You're going to have acid rain raining on our crops, on our buildings, on our people, on, on everything. And this, this, they've got the ear of the White House. The White House is seriously considering this. And this has caused um, some states, and Rhode Island is, is, seems to be in the forefront of this. They want to have, they're having a bill, it's called the Clean Atmosphere Act. And what, what the bill has says is, it is a legislative intent to preserve the safe, peaceful use of Rhode Island's atmosphere for people, the environment, and agriculture, and to expand upon, upon climate, excuse me, expand upon climate efforts by regulating weather modification and other large-scale atmospheric activities and prohibiting those which are harmful. And one of the best parts about the bill, besides what it is, it's written in plain English. Anybody can read it and understand it. You know, legislators usually have legalese and you don't know what the heck they're saying. Uh, and uh, the fossil fuel companies, of course, they want this because this way people will continue to use oil and gas and they won't stop using them because, oh, well, we're going to shade everything. So global warming won't be so bad. There's more to climate chaos and climate crisis than global warming. There's also deforestation and ocean acidification. And uh, this won't do anything for that. And when they put this sulfuric acid into the air, I'm not going to call it sulfur dioxide because it's going to be sulfur, uh, sulfuric acid not long after. When they do that, it's going to change the climate of wherever they spray it. But when they change the climate in one part of the globe, they're also changing in another part. So it's going to make the climate much worse in places like Africa and Australia and Southern Asia. And if they decide, well, then we'll spray sulfuric acid in the atmosphere, then you'll have dueling acid rain affecting North America and Europe, then affecting Africa and Australia and going back and forth. It's a crazy thing to actually be taken seriously. And it, it scares the bejeevers out of me. It is very scary. Um, and and there, there's, uh, um, there's a guy named Russ George who got caught dumping 120 tons of iron dust into the Pacific Ocean. And the reason he was doing that is that he thought this iron dust would help uh, algae to, to bloom. And certain kinds of algae would bloom and certain kinds of algae would be cr uh, crowded out. So he would be totally disrupting the balance of nature. And so they have this tunnel vision of what to do about global warming and, and, it, and it includes completely disrupting the, the natural environment. I mean, it's, it's totally crazy. And, and then there's uh, the artificial trees that they want to build. And so, you know, so we'll absorb carbon dioxide like trees do by making artificial trees. But why not use real trees? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what the heck? Just plant real trees and forests, not just a tree plantation. But a forest, and yeah, and and the whole thing with the wildfires in Canada, when they come back this summer, even worse because the El Nino is worse than it was last year, 
and we've already have, had a heat wave in February. So I expect the wildfires in Canada to come back. And then there's a whole thing of make, making artificial trees will come back. And I'm like, and like, where are you going to get your Christmas trees from? You get, I guess it's going to have to be artificial Christmas trees because they're burning down the ones in, in Canada. I, I, it's it, it, it's, it's so crazy. Canada, we can just about rename this segment Engineers Gone Wild. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, can yeah, you, a, Mark or Marilyn or Lenny, can you think of some specific examples of geoengineering that you find could work at all? And if not, do you have some other examples other than ones, ones that Ken said that uh, are really destructive? I would say uh, keeping uh, our uh, old growth forests intact. I mean, if you look at places like British Columbia, they're still cutting down all the old growth forests. Uh, and uh, if you look at places like the boreal forest across Canada, they're still cutting that down using clear cutting. So we need to preserve those forests and we could also do reforestation. That's a form of uh, geoengineering. But, uh, Is there any geoengineering that you think could work other than uh, looking at it from the naturalist point of view? Obviously, well, I would like I would like to say that um, just because something can be built, it doesn't mean that it needs to be built. And I think engineers particularly have tunnel vision and don't really appreciate or understand the connections that you've been making throughout this whole program, Charlie, about how everything is connected. Here's the problem and here's the straight line to connect it. Well, that doesn't really work so well in the natural world. And all of the geoengineering things that I have seen so far seem to ignore uh, any possible side effects. Was there anything in the Scotland um, in, in the Scotland meeting that, that talked about possible side effects, Ken? The scientists didn't. Uh, Naomi Klein asked them, but you know, they're not interested in that. They're interested in, in, yeah. in their little tunnel vision solution. And I think the only well, geoengineering, I can accept as an umbrella because that's solar radiation management on a personal level. And it's <laughs> and it's not ruining crops. It's not ruining buildings. It's not ruining somebody else who wants to get us on Dan. Um, so uh, that's about as, as big an, an effort. Uh, there, there are um, times where, where uh, in some of the coral reefs where they're shading just the area around the coral reef and only at the very, very hottest times of the day. How and in the world do they do that? How do they do that, Ken? Uh, they're, they're, they, they spray like a fog that, that uh, over, the, over the ocean and that, uh, it, that shades the coral reef. And, and it's made of water? Um, oh, no boy. other chemicals? Yeah, I, I did the show a while ago. Um, it's, it's mostly water. It's not only water. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean you don't memorize all the shows that you've done in the past 28 years? You don't have them at your fingertips? No, I, isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> I haven't memorized everything I've ever said. And uh, because I'm always working on my next show, right? And, and um, But this fog dissipates. Wow. Uh, and so when, uh, so the plants that live with the coral reefs are not gonna die because they've been completely shaded. They're shaded only during the hottest time. And that's the only time they deploy this fog. Um, so it, it's, it, you could say it's a type of geoengineering, but it's a very temporary uh, a thing, only for a, a very small area. It's not spraying the entire atmosphere. It sounds like uh, an environmentalist way of looking at things. The way Mark was talking about geoengineering, you took it out of the technical aspect of metals and uh, a, a real umbrella outside the planet that's <laughs> hundreds of miles across. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, so you, you're saying use forests. You turned it around, Mark, and I love the way you do that. So, okay, geoengineer, let's use nature's geoengineer. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. But I've never heard of that, that fog for the coral. That sounds interesting. Lenny, have you heard of any of these uh, particular things that might be useful? Uh, the, the one that, that I read a little bit about is spreading rock dust um, on, on certain lands. And uh, actually, rock dust is, is, a, is a very good um, fertilizer uh, on cropland because it's adding minerals to the soil. 
but the uh, the the rock when it's crushed up will absorb a certain amount of carbon dioxide more than just the bare soil will. Um, and I don't think it's been done on a very big scale. I think it's one of these things that's been proposed and tried on a, on a small scale, and you know suggested as an option. Um, it's not doing anything to the atmosphere. It's it's in, and it's not spreading something potentially toxic on the land. Um, so I think there may be some hope there. And this is similar as Marilyn was saying. This is a similar. Uh, you might say, scenario of nuclear energy and nuclear reactors. We were promised everything back in the 1950s, the end of the 90s, with these nuclear reactors and never having to build, uh, have gas plants or coal plants or <laughs> oil plants or any of that stuff. And it would just lead to everything being beautiful and work out. But they didn't think of the economics of it. They didn't think of the side effects. All of the side effects are as many as possible, such as the economics, the time length to build the thing, the waste products of it, the side effects of the uh, sicknesses that occur in clusters around these plants. So they're really not looking at these side effects. All of it, <laughs> that's just amazing. Well, there's a lot of uh, over-engineering, really, even if you look at hydroelectric, uh... Uh, plants and the dams that they use for hydroelectric power. There's so many adverse environmental impacts of that. So yes, you get the inexpensive power and they call it green, but uh, it's terrible for fish life. It's terrible for uh, so many of the species that uh, utilize the uh, riparian areas right along the edges of the uh, rivers. And uh, so it's an environmental disaster, even though uh, it might lower your electric bills. You're going to have to explain that word repairing. I don't know that word. Can oh, get the edges of river valleys. valleys. Say again. Yeah, it's the edges of river valleys and the rivers oh, and okay. the edges. Yeah. Yeah. 80, Ken, 80%. yeah. Ken, how long have they been shading the coral reefs? Is there any data about that over the years? Um, I just looked up my my own script for um, and the fogging strategy was done in Australia. And Science News Magazine did a report on it in November of last year. Oh, so that it, it's just starting. It's just starting. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, what what Science News reported on, and then we reported on what Science News said. There's a lot of different strategies uh, being used throughout the world to save coral reefs uh, from growing uh, coral larvae in a lab and then releasing it to um, finding if, if it's a predator that's destroying a reef, uh, how to get rid of the predator. In one place, people are diving down and picking up the predator of the coral reef and taking it away. Oh. And so there's a lot of different strategies to save the coral. And um, the the uh, ecologic we did on November 22nd, we, we talked about that a little bit. It's, it's available online. Um, We'll put that in the end credits, that's for sure. <laughs> Very worthwhile. Uh, and a couple of comments, Charlie, if we have time. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, first I was going to mention, say, a governmental aspect of this whole thing. Uh, we know that the uh, government of Switzerland has uh, asked the United Nations to spend, you know, some time and money, you know, figuring out the various aspects of this. Say, so particularly what happens along governmental borders. So let's say Switzerland is doing uh, the uh, solar geoengineering. Well, how will that impact Austria? Or how will it impact neighboring Germany? Mm -hmm. Or how, how will it impact Northern Italy? Uh, so um, uh, you don't want adverse consequences. It's bad enough to have them in your own country or your own state, but it's pretty much unacceptable to have them you know, filtering over into other governmental units. Uh, and secondly, uh, if you don't mind, just to get back to the Rhode Island legislation. Sure. I want, and for a lot of legislation, there's economic motives uh, behind them. There's, you know, different um, uh, stakeholders who have different interests. Sometimes they're economic interests that are very, very strong, pushing legislation one way or the other. And so I was wondering, who are the economic interests behind the bill in Rhode Island? And I do like the Rhode Island bill very much. I was wondering. I mean, I don't know how much the, you know, beach economy matters to the to overall Rhode Island. 
I would think it's actually fairly large, but yeah. is this coming from um, business owners who have businesses that are dependent upon the summer sunshine along the beach? Is this a way of them protecting themselves or is there some other interest group that uh, might be involved other than pure environmental uh, uh, Great interests? question. Anybody got an answer? Ken, you got anything on um, that? Well, I know that Rhode Island boasts of having more shoreline than any other state in the union uh, <laughs> because of all those islands. Right? Each one of those <laughs> islands has, has a complete shoreline. Uh, and the rivers that come down from uh, uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, um, right? So there's, I mean, no bill gets through any legislature without there being uh, an economic uh, part of it. And, and Mark, I bet you you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, I don't know the origin of this bill. Uh, uh, Jill McManus brought it to my attention, uh, knowing that I, I care about geoengineering. And um, so I have sort of learned about it after it had been introduced. It hasn't uh, gone through the legislature. It has not been signed by the governor. It's still in the process, um, but it's it's a great bill. I, I they they mentioned sulfur dioxide. Uh, they mentioned sulfuric acid uh, specifically in the bill, and and several other uh, solar radiation management uh, scenarios. So in a future episode, uh, our legislative professional here, <laughs> Mark. I would love if you find the time in your busy schedule to take a look at that and then to uh, bring it up as a discussion point for, for Ken and the rest of us. That would be, uh, yeah. if I can assign that to somebody, <laughs> that would be Not great. Gonna do it. Ken, do you want to uh, sum up what we're talking about? We're going to hear the, the, the term geoengineering and solar radiation management more and more as, as the, the months and years go by. And, uh, don't let anybody tell you that it's a good idea because the side effects are absolutely horrendous. Yes, let us not make the same mistake as we did with the nuclear plants, nuclear energy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. So I wanted to uh, talk about a, uh, a new piece of legislation that's coming forward in Florida. It's already been passed by the legislature, but has not yet been signed by the government. It doesn't allow local governments to protect these outdoor workers, say farm workers or construction workers, uh, from the effects of the climate crisis. So in places like Florida, the days are getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And you've got people working out there for long hours in the sun, and they don't always have access to water or to shade, and they're not always able to rest. So Miami-Dade was trying to protect those workers. The state legislature says no, after some heavy lobbying from a construction companies and agriculture industry, but it's expected that the governor of DeSantis uh, is going to sign that bill. There's a beautiful article from, um, I believe it's from Bloomberg, and the author is named Mark Gongloff. And I just love the way he said this, related to Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, has never met an act of political performative cruelty that he didn't like. So it's a foregone conclusion he's gonna sign this bill pretty much. Uh, likewise, in Texas, there was similar legislation uh, moving forward. Um, and it's another hot state that's only going to get hotter. And uh, it passed a law last year preventing orderly, overly progressive local governments from enacting worker heat protections. So again, you've got the same situation, construction workers, uh, farm workers, et cetera, who are out there in the heat all day long and local governments are not allowed to uh, uh, create any kind of legisl legislation or regulation uh, to help those workers and keep them from getting heat stroke. Or, uh, and many people you know, each year die of uh, heat stroke and heat exhaustion, particularly the elderly, but also uh, outdoor workers. So there's a particular name of the bill. Let me see, California has also looked at this and they've got a bill called the Asuncion Valdivia Heat, Illness, Injury, and Fatality Prevention Act. So Asuncion Valdivia uh, was a grape picker in, in Florida who died of heat stroke after working for 10 hours straight in 105 degree heat. So, uh, and the bill basically would force OSHA, it would force OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to make heat protection rules within a year. So generally, if there's an issue, it takes OSHA seven years to make a ruling because they're being lobbied by all these different corporate interests and 
and other interests as well. So this would force OSHA to regulate something about uh, protection from heat uh, within a year and to let the public and the other states know about that. So I wanted to bring that to your attention since it's getting, every year seems to get hotter and hotter. And these are some very vulnerable people need more protection, not less. Our goal is to bring to you, the viewer, our thoughts about today's environmental topics. That's the current ongoing and long-term concerns that we see through the eyes of grassroots activists. It has been said that money or economics is the most important thing in the world and makes our society work. But in our eyes, it's the environment that is most important and makes the world go round. It's in that light that we look at any and all of the topics that we talk about here at the Forum. All things are related to the environment, the entire cosmos, the smallest atomic subparticle. But we can't discuss them all in one setting, though try we might. We will try to connect the dots throughout our forum. We hope that with we, we hope that we at this forum have given you, the viewers, some food for thought as well as ways to do some meaningful actions. Feel free to contact us with your responses or even inviting us to one of your activities. Our presenters are available to go out and give talks on various environmental subjects. So until next time, enjoy nature of which we are all a part. I'm Charlie Olson for the Environment TV Forum.